Well, I want to welcome you to our Bible study today. This is the first Tuesday of Easter. And so let us begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful celebration of Easter as we learn again from the witness of Peter about what it means to have relationship with Jesus Christ. For it is in your precious name we pray. Amen. I mentioned to you today that today is the first Sunday of Easter. That word of is really important. Don't throw it away like it's unimportant. We are in the season of Easter. We are celebrating Easter for 49 days. But here's the great news for us Christians. We live Easter 365 days a year for our entire lives. We are so privileged. Remember, the early apostles did not have that privilege. They walked with Jesus, but they didn't truly know who Jesus was until the resurrection itself. And so they only lived the latter part of their lives in the resurrection. We live our entire life in the glory and the grace of God's gift of that resurrection. And so today, one of the lessons that we read on Easter Sunday is from the book of Acts, chapter 10. I want to take a look at this today because this story is about Peter and his testimony to the relationship he has with Jesus Christ. And so we're going to look at this in three different ways. I'm going to read it first of all. We're going to look at what Peter believes are the essentials to you having a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm also going to make sure you are dis uh, that we distinguish between the corroborating witnesses. You don't necessarily have to believe all the witnesses, but Peter gives all of these different witnesses who also testify to the same thing. He's saying, in essence, if you don't believe me, maybe you'll believe one of these other people who spoke the same type of word that I did. And then... Oddly, off the list are a whole bunch of things that I think you think are so important for your salvation and have absolutely nothing to do with it. These are the things, unfortunately, that divide churches, that get us condemning one another, and I guarantee you there are things on this list that have absolutely nothing to do with salvation. Well, I shouldn't say nothing to do. They certainly have something to do in terms of how we express our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so, therefore, they're important in that way, but they are not essential to our faith. So, let's take a look at this. First of all, a little bit about the background before we read it. Peter received a vision from God, very peculiar dream and vision from God, about all these different unclean meats, like meats that, that Jews are not permitted to eat, like pigs, oink, oink, Okay? We Christians eat pig, we oftentimes, we eat ham on Easter Sunday. Remember, Easter is actually originating from a Jewish holiday called Passover. And so I find it kind of really odd that we Christians eat pig on Easter Sunday. Seems kind of offensive to our, our, our cousins in faith, the Jews, from which our faith originates. But nevertheless... This may be related to, and I don't know historically, but it might be related to the vision of Peter and the reading of this lesson on Easter Sunday. Because Peter gets this vision that these items, these pigs, are not unclean animals. He finally gets the idea, or he's told, to go and visit this man named Cornelius. Cornelius is a Greek. And so then all of a sudden it dawns upon him, Peter, when he finally meets Cornelius. Cornelius says, I've been expecting you. God told me that you were coming. I want to hear about this Jesus. So it finally dawns on Peter what this vision was all about. That the Greeks are not somehow unclean by nature or virtue of them being Greek. That they also fall under the grace of God gifted to us in Jesus Christ, that there is nothing to be considered unclean. So, with this background in mind, uh, here he is in front of Cornelius, and now Peter gives Cornelius, the Greek, a testimony about what it means to have relationship with Jesus Christ. So, opening his mouth, Peter said these words, I most certainly now understand that God is not one to show partiality, but... In every nation, the one who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, 
he is Lord of all. You yourselves know the things that have happened through Judea, starting from Galilee after the baptism which John proclaimed. You know Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit, with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all these things that he did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on a third day and granted that he be revealed, not to all the people, but to witnesses who had been chosen by God beforehand. That is, to thus, oh, those of us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he ordered us to pre preach to the people to testify solemnly that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify of him that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. That's an amazing testimony. Just fantastic. So let's take a look at this. We want to work ourselves through this for a bit. So there's number one thing that he says this is an essential thing to faith. No one is excluded. No one is excluded from Jesus Christ, his grace that God has shown through to this world through him. Everyone is included. Oh, let me see here. The atheist down the street, uh, yep. God wants that atheist to know Jesus Christ. He's not, he's not somehow eternally cut off from God's grace because he's an atheist or she's an atheist. God's purpose is to love him or her. Oh, that, that uh, how about that Muslim? Oh, yes. That Muslim down the street, not cut off from God's grace. Certainly a part of God's bigger plan to love this world. That agnostic? Yes, absolutely. That Republican in your family who drives you crazy? Yes, that Republican who drives you crazy. That Democrat? Absolutely. That Democrat in your family that drives you crazy. See, God's grace is meant to be open to all people because there is nothing and no one who is unclean. So that's the first thing we learn. The second thing we learn is about Jesus Christ. I'm going to abbreviate that. Jesus Christ. And he says that he was anointed. I might run out of room because he mentions a bunch of things. He's anointed by the Holy Spirit. We'll come back to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is a corroborating witness, okay, to who Jesus Christ is. So hang tight with that. We'll come back. And then we're told that he set people free. From what? From the devil. From oppression, he set them free from these types of things. He was put to death. But he didn't stay dead. See, this is, you know, <clears throat> we can kill God's love. Jesus, by the way, isn't just a witness to God's love. Jesus is God's love. We kill witnesses to God's love all the time. Martin Luther King Jr., Mahatma Gandhi, okay? We kill all these, Bishop Oscar Romero, we kill all of these people who are witnesses to God's love. You know what? Once they're dead, they stay dead, at least in terms of this kingdom, this earthly kingdom. They'll be resurrected someday, we hope, to be in the kingdom of heaven. That's part of our hope. However, Jesus, even on this side of the kingdom of heaven, doesn't stay dead because he's not just a witness to the faith. He is God's love for this world. So, God's love, we put it to death. What that because we can't think of anything better to do to love. We kill it. But Jesus was raised from the dead because love is relentless and it keeps coming back. And what else did he do? He revealed, I know you probably can't read any of this. I'm sorry, but you can pull out your scripture. He revealed himself to the very first witnesses i.e. the apostles, revealed to the apostles so that they could in turn proclaim the good news. Once again, corroborating witnesses. And then he is judge. 
So this is really, you know, we, we, we confess in the Christian church the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, the Athanasian Creed. These are the three historic traditional church, uh, churches' confessions of our faith, but none of them are Scripture. They're based upon Scripture. They're a witness to Scripture. But Peter himself right here is telling us everything we really need to know. If you're going to write, I, I guess another testimony to Christ. These are the types of things that you would put down here. Jesus Christ, anointed, set free, put to death, raised from the dead, revealed uh, to those who would be witnesses, became the judge of the living and the dead. These are the things that you would certainly, most certainly want to include about who this Jesus is. Okay, so there you go. And then the other thing that are essential to faith, those who put their trust, this is really important. If you put your trust in this Jesus, what happens? We receive forgiveness. This is the whole reason why Jesus came, to make a new way for us to enter into heaven. Because, gosh, we can't do it by being good people. We don't do it by following the law. We don't do it by going to church. It's done for us in Jesus Christ. And we just trust that we receive forgiveness because of what Christ has done. <sighs> Isn't that like a big burden off your back? That's the whole point of Easter. To take away that burden that would weigh you down. So these are the essential things of faith. Now, he also mentions a bunch of corroborating witnesses. And this is important. These witnesses are not, we don't put our faith in the witnesses, but sometimes we trust certain witnesses, sometimes we don't. You know, in your life, I'm sure if somebody were to come and tell you, you know what, gosh, these guys are selling a car for 50% off. Can you believe it? Now, if it's one person who says that, you say, come on. But you know, there are other people that are trustworthy witnesses. And if that person in your life tells you something, you believe it almost 100% of the time. Because people's credibility, you know, is different depending on who the person is in their relationship with you. And so Peter, want, or Peter wants to make sure that you may not believe me, Cornelius, but maybe in some of the people on this list, you will believe. So Peter mentions a few corroborating witnesses. He first of all starts with the sons of Israel. Is the sons of Israel and their word. So again, I think he's talking more about the, the, the Old Testament and, you know, certainly, or maybe some of the other, the Jews who, who had come into relations with God. I'm not sure exactly who he's mentioning, but maybe Cornelius has heard from other Jews about who this Jesus was, or maybe he's talking about the scripture. I'm not exactly sure. Two, um, John the Baptist, J the B, okay? John the Baptist and his baptism. Now, baptism is not an essential. It's not over here. Baptism is a witness, a corroborating witness to the faith, but it is not an essential to the faith. And so he's making sure there's a distinction. Three, the Holy Spirit. Well, we don't come into relationship with Jesus Christ without the Holy Spirit, quite frankly. None of us. In fact, before you come into relationship with Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is working in your life. So the Holy Spirit kind of is, is over here, but at the same is, is an essential. You don't come to relationship with Jesus Christ, but uh, the Holy Spirit, in this case, the way that Peter is using it, is a corroborating witness, is giving testimony to the importance of who this Jesus is. Because did you notice again, the Holy Spirit, uh, when Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit. The word Messiah, by the way, means anointing. The Messiahs of the Old Testament, and there were, by the way, many Messiahs in the Old Testament, all of the kings were anointed with oil as a sign that they were chosen by God. But Jesus isn't anointed with oil. He's anointed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a corroborating witness to say that there's something unique about this Jesus and about his Messiahship compared to the others. Um, the disciples, he mentions the disciples, that they too walked with Jesus. And so they knew who this Jesus was. Disciples, there we go. 
And then, of course, the first apostles. And I know this brings up, well, what's the difference between an apostle and a disciple? Not all disciples were apostles. Okay, not all apostles were disciples. All right? Now, there's a lot of uh, connection between them. Now, Jesus had many, 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 many disciples. Not just the 12 that you think of in the Bible. Um, one of them, obviously, Judas Iscariot, never became an apostle. So many of the apostles, the 12, plus many of the women who followed Jesus, who were also disciples of Jesus, they became apostles because uh, they were witnesses to the resurrection. Okay? And Jesus revealed himself to them. So that was kind of the nature of being an apostle. Jesus Christ, after his death and resurrection, revealed himself to these people. Those were the folks who became the apostles, the people who had a corroborating witness that Jesus Christ raised from the dead because they saw him with, his, with their eyes, okay? And by the way, just a point of trivia, which isn't trivial. The very first apostle, the person who became the apostle to the apostles, the first witness was a woman, Mary, Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, every single one of us, can trace our faith lineage back to Mary Magdalene. We would not be a Christian this day were it not for her witness of being the first apostle, the apostle to the apostles. So then we go on, number six, the prophets. So again, what Paul is, or Peter, pardon me, what Peter is trying to tell you is this is the testimony of who this Jesus is. These are the essentials of faith. These are the people who witness to it. If you don't believe me, Cornelius, maybe you'll believe one of these folks. What I find intriguing at this point are all of the things not listed as an essential. The style of baptism. Were you dumped in water? Covered with water, where you baptize as an adult. You know, there's some people who get so angry that we baptize infants in our church. You're going to hell because you were never water baptized and dipped in water. Non essential. Non essential. Sorry, people. If we divide our faith, and we are divided in our faith because you believe that you must be dipped in water head to toe. And you don't believe that a person is a Christian because they haven't been dipped in water head to toe when they were an adult. You need to take a look at the witness of Peter. Nowhere is water baptism mentioned and how that water baptism happens and essential to us coming into relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a witness to our relationship with Christ. And I have very strong opinions as a Lutheran. In fact, as Lutherans, it's really important to us. In fact, baptism kind of is, is, the, is the way we get into this uh, discussion about relationship with Jesus Christ. It's important to us. Okay? It's a way we talk about our faith. But Peter doesn't mention that. Okay? The literal six-day, 24-hour creation period. If you don't believe in that, you don't believe in the Bible. Nowhere on here does it say that. I happen to, by the way, not believe that the Bible was literalistically created in six 24-hour peri uh, periods because I don't think that's what Genesis 1 is about. It has nothing to do with materialistic creation. It's about the creation of purpose and meaning and relationship. You have to look at the words and the style of literature. And the style doesn't really allow us to trans, uh, understand it as a literalistic story about materialistic creation. It's not a scientific textbook. It's not its intention. That's my opinion. I will argue for that. But you might get upset about the fact that I don't believe in a literalistic six-day, 24-hour period of creation 24, uh, 10,000 years ago, or whatever the case might be. Nowhere does Peter mention that as an essential to your faith? Are you pre, mid, or post-millennium in your faith about the book of Revelation? Well, by the way, I'm not, none of those. I think, I think it's bull. 
I don't think that Revelation has anything to do with the rapture and all these types of things. These are, this is, this is something that was created by a guy back in the 1800s. This is not how Revelation is supposed to be understood. But again, it's my opinion. No, it doesn't matter. It's not on the essentials. Uh, do you speak in tongues or not? If you don't speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit. If you blah, 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 blah. Again, is it on here? No. Not on here. Not an essential. Holy Communion. Well, again, Holy Communion and Baptism are two of the most important things for us Lutheran Christians and how we frame and understand our faith and our relationship with Jesus Christ. Not on the list. That doesn't mean it's... I, adiaphora, by the way, means non-essentials. I'm not... There are a lot of Lutheran pastors who are getting really upset with me right now if they're listening. It's not that they're not important. But our view of holy baptism and our view of, of, of holy communion do not get us to heaven. It's non-essential in terms of our getting to heaven. It may be essential in terms of how we express our faith, and that's great. But people who don't believe the things I do about Holy Communion believe all of these things. They're my brothers and sisters in Jesus. Oh, let's go on. Peter is the first pope. Not on there. Okay? Not on there. I bet you Peter would be embarrassed by this idea that he was the first pope and has become the authority of the church for all these millennia. Probably would be. That's not probably how he thought of himself. Non-essential. Notice he doesn't set himself up that in that way. Doesn't. Um, are you a liberal or conservative? Okay, I know a lot of liberal Christians who believe all of these things. They would be listed as liberal because they don't believe all the things that maybe you do. Okay, let me list a few. Jonah. Is, was Jonah and the whale a true story, or is it a children's story that was created for children to express uh, a relationship with God? <laughs> well, but you don't believe the Bible if you don't believe Jonah is a true man. There are all sorts of stories in the Bible. Parables that Jesus told, stories that we don't believe were real stories. They're just stories. So you're telling me that I can't go to heaven if I believe that Jonah was not a real guy? That it's just a story through which uh, God is trying to communicate to us the importance of a relationship with God? Do you see how this is going? Not on here. Not on the list. The Gospel of Matthew. Was it really written by the, Matthew the Apostle? Or was it written by somebody else and Matthew's name placed on it later? Well, some people would say that's a really liberal perspective. Who cares? Not on the list doesn't matter. Was Isaiah one prophet who prophesied all these things, or was he multiple prophets throughout the millennia? Oh, people's blood are boiling. He was just one prophet, one prophet at one time. No, notice again, not on the list. Not on the list. Doesn't matter. God still speaks through Isaiah, whether this was one man or multiple prophets throughout the millennia. Who cares? I mean, it's important in terms of research, maybe understanding this a little bit better. Was the Pentateuch written by Moses? Or is Moses just the focal point of these books that we call the Pentateuch? Okay, again, non-essentials of faith. King James, only ism. Is this the only book that you should read? Are all these others are corruptions and liberal corruption? No, you know, come on, people. Nowhere does the King James Version of the Bible mentioned here. It is not the authorized version of the Bible by God. It's authorized by publishers who published it who want you only to buy the King James Version of the Bible. But it is not the only book or the only translation. In fact, I would contend that it is an inferior translation to more contemporary translations because it's based on inferior Greek texts. But here's the amazing thing about the King James Version. It is a faithful witness to these things. You can read the King James Version of the Bible and believe in these things. You can read the NIV, believe these things. You can read uh, the New American Standard. By the way, that's what I read, New American Standard. Believe these things. You can read um, the Jerome Bible, believe these things. Okay? 
These things are the essentials to faith. All the rest in terms of relationship with God, ooh, let me put a big red X. You know, I'm not saying that they're totally unimportant, but they're not things that should be dividing us as Christians. Peter says, this is what is required of one to sh that shares our same faith, that no one is excluded from God's kingdom and from his desire for this world, that Jesus Christ was anointed through the gift of the Holy Spirit, set free people who were in bondage, put to death, he was put to death, was raised from the dead, and revealed his glory to the world, his resurrected glory to the world. And he's, as a result, become judge of both the living and the dead. And he wants to bring us forgiveness of sin so that our burdens might be set free. That's it. That's a testimony to your faith. All the rest, in terms of salvation the things that seem to divide us as a church, that we get in fights about. We don't ever get in fights about this. Do you know, Roman Catholics believe this. Yes, they do. Baptists believe this. Lutherans believe this. Okay? And yet we get in the long, drag-out fights about things that have nothing to do with salvation. And we treat each other like we are going, to, that other group is going to hell because they don't believe these things. If it ain't on this list, but you believe the things on this list, you are my brother and sister in Jesus Christ. I think we need to reduce our list of things that are important. And this is it right here. This is the testimony to the faith that we share in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for the essentials of faith, what Jesus Christ has come to do. Isn't it amazing? It's really all about what Jesus has done for us. And it's very simple. That he was appointed by God through the gift of the Holy Spirit, set us free from bondage. He died, rose again, revealed his glory to us so that he might be judge of the living and the dead. We too might be set free from sin. There you go. That's what we need to know. This is a gift for all people. And so we get so upset about things that are not on this list, God. We need to let it go because the world is depending upon us, the Church of Jesus Christ right now, to be witnesses to this historic faith that we share. So let us let go of our bigotries, our biases, our theologies, and hold on to Jesus. For he asks us in his precious name. Amen. I hope this is a beneficial lesson for you, and I hope it gets you to rethink how you present Jesus Christ to the world and what is truly important. May God's blessing be upon you. May God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit keep you now and forever. Go in peace and serve him. Amen.